technical side saying, you know what, actually the future money possibly goes away when everybody knows everybody else. And this guy is saying, that's absolutely right, but you know, privacy, getting rid of cash must have been getting rid of privacy. And I subscribe to this view completely. So knowing who everybody is in a transaction, I mean knowing in the transactional sense. I don't mean a full disclosure of everybody's identity at all stages, because that's a different thing, right? <clears throat> we were talking about the example before we walked in here. There's a world of difference between proving you're 18 to a pub to get a drink and telling the pub your name and address and where you live and all this sort of stuff. They're completely different things. Now, I think um, if we take that privacy point on board, I think that gives us a little kind of inkling into where we're going. So I'm going to say, I'm going I'm to frame my part of the discussion in this way. Weatherford was talking about Neolithic clans. Now obviously the clans we're moving into aren't going to be that same kind of thing. So let's use the word communities instead. So we're all going to belong to multiple communities. Some of them geographic, but most of them not geographic. Most of them they're going to be self-defined. It's going to be identities that we choose to enter into different groups. And within those communities, there'll be no need for money because mutual cross obligations within the community will serve instead of money. You, you might still need a kind of money in order to move between those communities. And that sort of seems reasonable to me. So I can I, of course, you know, you'll argue that those currencies that you need will become sort of reserve currencies, and that might or might not be true. I have to think that through a bit. Um, uh, we'll think that through a little bit more. But in answer to the question, uh, sorry, that, that took away my big finish. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to back up a sentence, otherwise it spoils my big finish. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So within those communities, we operate without money, and we use something else instead. So that gives me my big finish. What is money? Trust. Okay, thanks very much. or Bitcoin events and uh, have a dreadful tendency of leaving the audience uh, horrified, dismayed and confused. Um, so we could either kind of go all the way down into the really kind of esoteric far out stuff or we could be relatives and start to take it small. <coughs> Can I have a kind of rough show of hands? Who wants the crazy version? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, crazy version. You want the crazy version? Right. Who wants something that they could potentially work on the next five years? Yeah. <laughs> One or two. Okay. So, uh, I want to start by talking about the nature of grey areas, right? I did a bit of reading around to see what people were saying about what money was before I came this evening. And uh, I saw a remarkable argument made from somebody not so far from here, that uh, law defined money. And I think that this is a very strong, very practical argument, in as much as law defines lots of institutions like marriage, or taxation, or a whole bunch of other but actually, the, the zone of things that law defines and the zone of things that actually happen are disjunct sets, right? There's a huge amount of stuff which happens that is either not legal or even more interestingly, neither legal nor illegal because nobody's ever thought about it. And there's an enormous amount of stuff that happens which is blatantly illegal and goes on for years because nobody cares about enforcement. So, in a sense, until a specific situation goes all the way up the court system and all the way back down the other side with an actual ruling and a decision and enforcement and all the rest of that stuff, the whole thing exists in this kind of, you know, jelly-ish grey area. It just kind of has this long, flexible thing attached. So if we start the question of what is money with this notion that we have 
nice, clean, crisp, accurate definition that we can then use to reason about what's happening in the environment, we're always going to automatically be inside the kind of government box legalism that gives you nice, clean, precise answers that have nothing at all to do with the real world. Right? Or we could take the other approach and we can say, right, well, what money is is defined by common practice. And there are a set of behaviours that we expect to see more of or less of that generate things like common law marriage or common law money. Right? Well, you know, over here they seem to be doing a whole bunch of trade in cigarettes and taxi tokens. Over here the currency appears to be phone minutes. You know, is that money? It's trying to sort of money. It's a lot like money. It's money with that mirage. It seems to expire. It's issued by corporation. It'll be replaced by something else in two years. So, <clears throat> Once you get into this notion that there are crisp, concrete, real things which age relatively well, they're fairly protected, they've got durability like the state. And on the other side, you have this kind of ephemeral zone of cultural transformation where things kind of come in and out of focus. It becomes a lot easier to ask questions like, what is money? Because the real answer is, how far along this curve towards absolute solidity has a given kind of transaction or commerce gone, right? What we're looking at here is essentially an adoption curve with private practice among small groups at one end, all the way right up this ramp until the thing is not only established nationally but enshrined in international treaties. Does this kind of make sense as an initial frame, right? So it's not necessary at any one point to have this nice, sharp, black and white cut off. Now it is money, now it is not money. It's actually a series of decisions made by a bunch of different actors and different entities about whether something is money enough for them to regulate or adjudicate over or even accept. Um, has anybody in this room heard of e gold? Okay, a couple of hands. So I was part, of, I was a heavy user of a digital currency that ran uh, from about the mid 90s to about 2005, 2006 called e gold. An e-gold, at the height of its power, was about $80 million worth of gold sitting in vaults in Dubai and Canada, I think. And it was tradable uh, as an account-based currency with all the transactions being done in days. You know, I, I think, I seem to remember, I was getting paid about five ounces of gold a month. At the time, gold price was pretty low and I was doing quite well. And you could either take that out as a <coughs> coins, or you could have them out change it by sending wire transfers to places. And a community of people grew up around that that treated gold as money because it had acquired a lot of fungibility. But the evil company kept going back to the federal government and asking for a banking license because, as far as they were concerned, they were simply a bank that operated in gold. Please regulate this, please, please regulate right here. And uh, eventually, in 2005, the federal government decided that it would be much easier to arrest them all than to regulate them. <laughs> <laughs> and they were finally done. That. I seem to remember the exact charge was banking without a license. So, this is a classic example of something that had widespread community adoption that theoretically one administrative decision dragged that over the hump and it would have become a nice, clean, standard part of the financial system. But somewhere in there, a regulator looked at it and was like, ah, oh, this is not for us, this is not for us, this is not for us, ah, kill it for And that reaction, I see all of that same psychology playing out around blockchain technology. Right? You know, what is it? Whatever. Is it money? Well, it depends who you ask. Um, um, what should we do about that? I don't know. Should we regulate it? Could we, do we understand it well enough to decide whether we can kill it or not? Why do we ignore it and then later on, in a rash panic, we can do something drastic? <laughs> and that is the standard approach, right? That is just how business is done relative to state regulation. So, um, this kind of teeter-totter of gradual acceptance followed by radical snapback is a fundamental cultural trait, right? If you look at the negotiations around, say, euthanasia, right, that's going through all of the same kind of creeping acceptance, dramatic bash, backlash stuff that you see around Bitcoin, that you used to see around Ecom. Any area where society is not really sure what something is, has a lot of kind of slow creeping progress and gradual acceptance, followed by episodes of irrational panic. And if it dies in one of the irrational panic, it's usually it's gone for some repeat generation of a century. Right? Things kind of creep in until eventually you've got a generation that has grown up with them kind of over here as a thing that people do, and 
that generation assumes that this stuff is normal and normative, and after that it becomes orthodoxy. And that process, I, I don't think ever really happens faster than generation. This, I think, is a key piece of analysis that a lot of the uh, Bitcoin guys are missing, is that until you've got a generation that have grown up using Bitcoin in high school to buy and sell, I don't know, whatever it happens to be, uh, in baseball cards, they're really never going to feel like this stuff is money, because technology is anything that was invented after you turned 40. Right? <laughs> Everything until that point is just reality. And then you begin to get this thing that this stuff begins to feel like technology. I mean, I'm perfectly comfortable with you know, parallel computers and you know, cryptography and all the rest. Ah, it's all just fine. You begin to talk to me about this, you know, nasty, scary, wet biological stuff where we're talking about 20 years of life expansion by, you know, injecting people with goo to, you know, uh, stick bits back on the end of their telomeres, and that begins to feel like technology now. It really is a little intimidating. Hmm. So, everybody got a nice, clear sense of this curve. And then, you know, social push forward, backlash forward, backlash forward, backlash. Now, um, who is comfortable that they understand blockchains reasonably well? Okay, show of hands. Anybody want to come up here and explain them to the audience? <laughs> 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 brave, brave. <laughs> so, um, I'm strongly of the opinion that um, the blockchain thing is best understood as being a kind of uh, administrative upgrade to the good old-fashioned SQL database, right? It's a spreadsheet, right? The, the problem with SQL databases was always that you wound up with this enormous, vicious priesthood that sat on top of them to protect them from people like you. And the blockchain guys kind of eventually come up with a database which is so aggressive that it doesn't need any database administrators to protect it. It's like the Tyrannosaurus Rex database. You need enormous warehouses filled with burning machinery that basically just sit there and have computations and radiators. But at the end of that, you can get a database that everybody can write to, nobody can edit, nobody can hack, and the bloody thing is as permanent as the social construct that pays for it. And then any monkey can write a bunch of scripts which read and write stuff from that database, and this we call the blockchain economy. Right? When you put it in those kind of terms, it becomes fairly obvious that it would be you know, foolish and naive to regulate away a technology like this. Well, what is it? It's a database. Well, it's a really resilient database. Mm, fantastic. What are people doing with this really real resilient database? Uh, last words, money laundering, and organized crime. Oh, we're against that. <laughs> well, you were against that before they had a database. Didn't you? Right? So, this notion right, that you have a relatively confined breakthrough in computer science that happens stuff a bunch of software written against it by a bunch of people that are basically anti-state libertarian weirdos. And that the result is that this piece of computer science technology becomes irrevocably welded to a set of politics that most people find kind of abhorrent. You know the phrase, um, you can have uh, anonymous digital cash or a welfare state, pick one. Right? Most people can understand the dialogue in those terms, you know, you can go for it. And this also gets into both in Scandinavian digital currency where they're attempting to figure out how you build taxation right into the heart of the digital currency systems. So that you could potentially have a perfectly stable nanny state. So, to kind of round this off, we have this very interesting technology that gives us a good, clean, you know, kind of velociraptor database. Right? It's a database that can take care of itself. Feral database. And then around that, people build applications that have a very different structure because the feral database doesn't or a priesthood and, you know, kind of three-phase power to maintain it. And what you see is this leakage of technology and power out of the institutions that have the technical infrastructure and the staff to maintain this kind of structure into the hands of people that have previously had no access at all to resilient computation. And I think this is the frame of analysis. Right? You know, once you have a resilient computation layer out there, anybody can pile stuff on top of it. And the stuff that get piled, gets piled on top of that is the stuff that you can't build anywhere else. Right? And this is where you then get started down the path. Right? A technology that is genuinely durable in the face of resistance and censorship is always going to be used for things that other cheaper, better technologies that are vulnerable can't be used for. Right? If 
only outlaws can really have enough spare cash to bother spending it on blockchains, only outlaws will have blockchains. But who those outlaws are varies depending on where we are at this curve. Right? If Wall Street really gets on top of Bitcoin, the government regulates it, and they start basically uh, KYCing new Bitcoin accounts, you know, unless you've got a nice clean federal certificate on your key, you're not going to believe that your cash is still there. Not hard to detect. Right? That's a process whereby that particular thing now has the full status of money because it has been blessed by that most conservative authorities. Right? Whereas if that doesn't happen and it gets pushed back down, you wind up with this kind of permanent stable Bitcoin powered utopia because it's been adopted so far in and then it kind of got big no rather than the big yes. Right? Welcome to society, here are your handcuffs, or very sorry you're not coming in, get back over there into your cave. Now, does this all kind of make sense as a frame? Yeah, I did promise you some partners. So, right now, we exist in a profoundly unfair world, right? We all know this kind of power wall wealth distribution thing. You know, what was it, on the order of uh, 150 people with about as much wealth as the bottom three and a half billion? You know, so if we disenfranchise about 3,000 people, everybody in the world can double their wealth apart from those 3,000 people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Clearly, 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 that's only 3,000 people. They could each have a small private island, right? And we can double the amount of wealth with the average version of taxes. It's not that unlikely that when you have a world with that kind of wealth inequality, and you get this kind of extremely durable computation of technology, in widespread adoption, particularly in places where you can't run regular services, that you're going to get political change on the back of the ability to have uncensorable free speech. And if you think about the amount of trouble and the sheer volume of mass murder that was caused by Marxism, you know, on the order of a quarter of a billion served, um, it really begins to worry me because how long do we have? Before the combination of enormous poverty, poor out numbers, roughly 10 people, plus resilient computation, results in the necessary preconditions for a very, very, very sudden shift in the global political right? path. As you know, the, the radical edge, the people that are currently largely excluded from reindeer games, finally figure out how to break down the doors, at which point it doesn't really matter what the Western states say yes or no to about common practice and because they're not really going to be doing anything other than putting out fires at their own borders. Right? It, <coughs> these technologies don't exist in a static political vacuum. Right? We only vote roughly as often as we did uh, at the very beginning of English democracy. Right? And the four year electoral terms have been around for what, something like 250, 300 years. Right? So everything else in society is accelerated by a factor of 50, 100. Voting is still happening at the same pace as did 300 years ago. As a result, it's become increasingly irrelevant. So, this whole notion that resilient computation is just about some kind of, you know, obviously little digital currencies that a bunch of libertarians are running around trying to present as the Messiah, this is kind of ridiculous, right? There just isn't enough of a gradient there for very much to really happen. Real gradients are massive pre existing structural poverty in the world, which is led to colonials. And on the other side of you have populations that are going to get their first smartphones and their first access to, access to resilient computation platforms in the same generation. And I think the question for us, now, whether it's money or whether it's not money, it doesn't really matter, right? What matters is whether it's power. And if it is power, um, because it's free software, it's the kind of power that anybody can have regardless of how little money they've got. The possibility is that what we're going to encounter is super empowered poor people who have numbers 10 to 1 renegotiating the global balance of everything. In a time when the climate is breaking, uh, life extension is becoming practical, virtual reality is everywhere, and robotics are beginning to get to the point where they're good enough to scare you. All simultaneously inside of the next decade. Does this sound like it's going to be fun? I mean, as members of a largely very conservative industry, uh, if I was you right now, I would be absolutely terrified. But it's not the Bitcoin guys, I mean, they can be co-opted extremely easily. It's the fact that the entire global structure that led to these concentrations of wealth in the first place is under enormous pressure from the bottom up as they get their cell phones. 
And this negotiation between um, those with capital and those without the income, I think is going to be the defining moment of the internet as we go from a largely white privileged internet to a largely poor and brown internet. And the negotiation that we're going to have over these electronic platforms about the nature of the global system is really where the pain points are going to be. It's not about finance, it's about identity, it's about access to education, it's about censorship. Danish cartoonists or French cartoonists being assassinated by Muslims who've imported their values and their guns at the same time as we're sending out flying over deaths calls who are killing their own countries. All of that stuff is just a precursor of what happens when you wind up with 4 billion poor people, resilient computation itself. Um, if you would like to join me up here, I would like to facilitate a queue. That would be fantastic. I really appreciate it, guys. Get them all out. Because I'm the guy that's standing up and speaking, I'm going to be really cheeky and, and ask a question myself and hopefully get the ball rolling. So, I, I like uh, somebody recently described Bitcoin to me as being like digital gold, except it's gold that can teleport because I can move it anywhere in the world near instantly and it still has the value that people, everybody, the market perceived it had when it moved initially when it, when it disappeared. So, Dave, you made a point, uh, I think, in your conversation that you said there might need to be these sorts of reserve currencies or ways of translating between different types of value and data. Can you see, and Vinay and Dave, Bitcoin playing a role in that, or something like Bitcoin playing a role in that? Is there, is there value in that, perhaps? Oh, thanks very much. Well, I mean, I, I agree quite strongly with Vinay that the, the real revolution is the blockchain not Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And I think that was I think that was considered, you know, uh, an unusual view a couple of years ago, but I'd say that's probably mainstream in the opinion now. So I, I'm much more interested in the blockchain mm -hmm. than about Bitcoin. Um, it's interesting we, the idea that currencies will be based purely on the cryptography, I I'm unconvinced of that. So I think these currencies are much more likely to be related to... See, if they're rooted in communities, they're going to be based on something to do with community values, or they're going to be something to do with... I mean, corporations don't last forever, but people will always need energy, or people will always need calories, or something. I mean, I don't know, but I think they're more likely to be something like that. Well, you know, Bitcoin, I don't want to be mean, but you know, Bitcoin is a way of keeping score in the mining network. Mm -hmm. You know, and it has a valuable role for doing that. But it's quite a jump to turn it into a currency from that. And you know, I mean, other people have different views, and I'm perfectly prepared to listen to them. Um, but it, it, it doesn't grab me that way. Yeah. Services, if you're a unicorn or something that was legally legitimate, it would be an actual global market. It would have a kind of well established value. The fact that there are basically very few places that are using Bitcoin that establish its value against services rather than humans, <coughs> I think it's one of the reasons that it's got such a in the world. So it's easy for me to imagine that if Bitcoin guys get their stuff together and wind up with professional services as the fundamental back end, I don't see any reason why Bitcoin shouldn't become quite stable. But if you're not going to back it by the function of an actual economy, then at that point you must have the same kind of protection that you've got for the dollar. Right? You know, here's America, it's shares in America, don't ask questions, it's all fine. Right? Dollar. And that, that's, that's workable. Right? Yeah. You point to the Bitcoin economy, show me the transactions which are only possible because Bitcoin exists. They're just learned the transactions. So, 
the bull mark of international trade in Bitcoin for, I think, I think professional services are key. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's a restriction, right? If they have that service. On the other hand, um, you know, Bernard Leiter got a group called Future Map. So, yeah. So he was the guy that designed Come to F4 and what he described a few years ago. So he was the guy that designed the convergence mechanism for the Euro. That was designed by a Pretty much the guy that invented the concept of complementary currency as a description of existing practice. So he didn't invent it, but he came up with the term to describe it. We had first started tracing a thing called the Terra. And the Terra is the idea of doing a global reserve currency that is backed by natural resources, largely ecosystem service generating resources. So here's the sustainable harvest of the ocean, here's the oxygen regenerating capacity of rainforests, here's the future food production of this subset of top soil. And we're going to use these things as backing for reserve currencies. So if poor nations begin to fell their forests for cash, their currency defaults. Uh, yeah. And you know, I mean, much as the euro is mixed bag, it's there and it's going to be around for a really long time. Long it's got at least as good a chance to survive as the dollar. Um, imagine if blockchain technology plus terror. And you can put a loop around that and go, well, you know, maybe so, maybe so. Um, but without backing, you know, it's either going to have to be backing by use, or it's going to have to be backing by asset and source by many guns. And if it's not either one of these things, uh, how's it going to be? I don't know. Um, yeah. Questions? Anyone? For sure. Yes. Because I'm, I'm groping this out just like everybody else is, but the 
something appealing to my, in my head about the sort of community-based argument. For what it's worth, uh, Claudia uh, was a technology for doing network monitoring. So it will identify complex uh, ISO value trade lines among a set of possible transactions. And the only way to make it work, even though the money is changing hands, is to value everything in the public dollar market. So Yes, in fact, there was a, there was a, I worked on a, there was a study done for the city of London a couple of years ago that I contributed to, I've forgotten what the, but it was about that, it was about could the city of London be a focus of part of networks as it is for other kinds of financial networks. Yeah. And I remember one of the things floating around there was London could potentially set a benchmark value standard for that. You'd have like the London mark or something which would be the, 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 the version used by these barter networks. Yeah. You, <coughs> I think it was going to be like a basket of commodities. Or I don't remember exactly. But in, in practice, <coughs> that dislocation of money as a measure from money as a commodity changing hands seems to be a good stuff that you're working in the field. Right down here we become a long tail. That's the actual practice. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think there's a notion that in practice, <coughs> as you money as a measuring tool, Sorry, just to reflect on the last question, so I don't know if this is any kind of measure, but you know, we're a consulting company and people only pay us to do things that they're actually interested in. And by far, and we have a number of different Bitcoin projects, by far the biggest Bitcoin project that we work on has absolutely nothing to do with payments or money. You know, it's more to do with the, the sort of digital asset management you were talking about. Can you could you just take a stab at, at how you how you see I mean if if this dislocation is to take place and 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 it's going to move from where it is to where you're sort of suggesting it'll go there's quite a the, the, I guess there may be two or three scenarios as to how that might happen I mean either you get some form of catastrophe which requires which we might get simply because of the way the current monetary system is being managed and handled which means that, that there has to be a completely different approach. But whatever it is, it seems to me that there's going to be a challenge because it's relatively easy, but not that easy. I listen to you and I catch probably only about 20% of what it is that you're, that you're saying. But for the general public and particularly for the custodians of society to get their heads around all this and work out how any form of transition takes place, it's, it's actually quite difficult to see how that will happen. So it could be traumatic because for some reason or another a major dislocation brings it about or a major a major event happens. Or or it could be gradual and wise and careful stewardship that I, moves us from one to the other. No, I understand your question. I mean personally I, I think it's more likely to come from this law of unintended consequences mm. that I said at the beginning. I know, I know my example is very London centric, but London has such a rich history uh, of all of this kind of, you know. The, and, I, and of course, I'm very familiar with all these examples, but the way that the tally sticks went from being a Norman record of taxes mm. Mm. To, to an element of government monetary policy, <clears throat> you know, we, we didn't stop using them until 1829. I mean, it just, it's again very conservative. Um, the way they became the kind of store of value was, was, was unintended. The point about the Bank of England, I think, is that nobody was sitting around saying, if only we had paper notes that we could, that just wasn't what happened. You know, the bank was founded for a completely different purpose, war against France, as it happens. So, I'm not saying the money wasn't wasted. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It was founded for a completely different purpose. And then it happened that the notes found traction amongst the merchant. I mean, remember for a long time, the smallest bank in the note was five pounds, an enormous sum of money. And yet for merchants, it became more convenient to serve, blah, blah, blah. So I. What, well, the 50 pound note is today? <laughs> 500 euro. <laughs> so I, I tend to go for I tend to think it's going to be something to do that. Find something that I, 
I also, and again, I can't prove any of this with the spreadsheet work, but I have a strong suspicion it's going to be something with energy as well. Because you see these nascent startups, I mean, I'm aware of quite a few, that are looking at looking at the idea of energy-based currencies of one form or And that's because they want things that have long-term mm. store of value, which goes back to the uh, pension point, right? What, what do you want to put in your pension point? Do you want to put pounds in there, which you have absolutely no idea what they'll be worth when you retire? Or do you want to put kilowatt hours in there, because you know that when you're retired, you're going to need a certain number of kilowatt hours? Um, do you see this as being a kind of either or, or being the same kind of thing that sold credit cards coming in to say your cash and not being displaced? Is it, is it that you wind up with additional payment options, additional storage value? Or do you think some of the old stuff will die in the only way? That, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think <clears throat> we had a fantastic FS Club debate up in Scotland last year before the referendum about whether Scotland should have its own currency. Um, and the point is, yeah, because it's like, you know, why don't you just use euros or why do you have your own currency? Well, because it's an emblem. Uh, I'm, a, I'm talking um, <coughs> at next and next week with Nigel Dodd, who's just written this huge book called The Social Life of Money, which looks at all of these different angles. The thing is, we're thinking of money because of our context tonight, purely in the sort of financial sense, but actually money has a lot of other dimensions. And in reality, to try and understand the changes, you'd have to understand these other dimensions, which I don't. So there are social, psychological, national, other aspects to it as well. I suppose because I'm arguing for plurality, my, my guess is that a lot of them will be circulating at the same time. Mm. You know, if we go back a couple of hundred years, like when you were talking about this being the, that East End shopping mall yep. a couple of hundred years ago, then nobody would have thought it at all off that you were buying some things with Dutch guilders and German marks. Mm. But everybody knew the relative value of these things. It wasn't, you know. And of course, we're in a smartphone age, so there might be hundreds of these currencies circulating, but you might not even know it because, you know, I'm going into the Tesco next door and buying something with my phone. And so it's up to my phone and Tesco to sort out what money they get. I don't even really care. You know, I mean, so it's you know, an interesting the price in Tesco could be in some weird currency I've never heard of. But what my smartphone shows me is my preferred currency choice or, or whatever. Right? You see what I mean? It's like I do. I mean, in fact, just one comment and then, and then I'll shut up. But, it, but, but it, it is an interesting <coughs> thesis, isn't it? That if, if, if the management of money becomes so profligate, in other words, as money as we stand, understand it today, and, and somehow or another, people's confidence in it starts to disappear because it's been so heavily abused that other surrogates that are coming into play, which are made possible by blockchain technology, suddenly start to become much more attractive. So if you take your energy example, if I suddenly think, actually, I, you know, they've been printing so much money over the last 20 years that I we've lost track of really how much it's worth and what value it is and does it do any good anyway and all the rest of it. But actually the thing I am interested in is kilowatt hours. So can anybody give me something in kilowatt hours? Blockchain can give you that in kilowatt hours. That's where I'm going to go. And you suddenly get a multiplicity of kind of, I mean, that, that stretches society's structures massively, I think. This is a question about fact, right? I mean, this is the distinction of money relative so, um, you know, solar panels have dropped in price by 7% a year, every year for the past 40 years. They were this very long, very slow, very stable exponential curve. Right now, they are roughly at great parity. Um, about 10 years ago, I worked on what called the Smallest Profitable, which was one of the economists' book of the year in 2003, really describing uh, how you actually calculate the value of decentralized energy resources, because the standard power industry accounting practices just can't they have no way of understanding what happens in that kind of environment. So 10 years from now, if that trend continues or accelerates, which is more likely, 
silver would be half the price of grain power. Ten years after that, it would be a quarter of the price of grain power. Ten years after that, it would be an eighth of the price. You know, I mean, at some point, you hit some kind of asset project physical limit. You also hit a point where nobody cares to make it any cheaper because it's just the cheaper than it needs to be. And it winds up being priced in shoes fashion. So, when we start thinking about you know, kilowatt currencies, the notion that your kilowatt currencies have ever <coughs> simply by virtue of the fact you know, that they're deflated. Um, electronic equipment, you know, I mean, you look at, you go to any of the second-hand camera stores in London, and you see gear that was a thousand pounds five years ago is now on sale for about 150 quid, right? You know, old computers, same thing. And so we're in this position where we've got this enormous deflationary weirdness coming in technology. And I think in some ways, some of what we're scrambling for is that all of our money assumes that you're dealing with scarce resources that become scarcer, <coughs> rather than abundant resources that become more abundant. And we don't actually have a logic of exchange when the fundamental assets that your society is based on are increasing in a predictable way on one side, and then you've got all this extreme scary environmental weirdness on the other. Like the confusion about value and the durability of value, uh, I think is really fundamental. And I don't even know who's got a hand in this. You know, most of the energy think tanks and the ecology think tanks have no clue about finance. Most of the people that are worrying about technological acceleration don't talk uh, ecology or finance. You know, it's kind of ecology, finance, and technological acceleration under one roof. It hasn't actually happened yet. I think we desperately need it to steer us. Because without that, anyone that's working on any one of those trends individually is going to get slapped on the head by the other two. I think two things about that. And I'm not, I'm not sure which one I think is more probable, but I can see that in, if that's true, if you move into a world without scarcity, then money has two, two possible. So either you go into a Star Trek world where there is no scarcity and therefore no money. Nobody ever pays for anything in Star Trek. Because there is no money because there's no scarcity. Um, which is, to me seems... There's always going to be a scarcity of something. Restaurant, restaurant. Um, which, yeah. They do, they do exchange stuff in planets and stuff. It's only important to ship that stuff. They do, sorry? <coughs> they do right. exchange stuff with planets. Uh, it's only yeah. important to ship this stuff. That's a sealed unit. Like, oh, it's, right. it's a military yeah. ship. It's a military yeah. ship. It's a military ship. It's a military ship. It's a great clash for yeah. a military ship. <laughs> I, I probably should have used the economic text for rather than Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's better it's in the far future. But there's always going to be something uh, that's scarce and you know, money can shift to that extent. Which actually links to your your point about what you might call emerging market disruption. Yeah. Because if you use the blockchain So for example, if you think in in the London market, I mean I I'm not sure exactly, but I would have thought the biggest use of the blockchain in the London market you know, it's probably going to be around digital assets, you know, corporate uh, uh, that kind of stuff, right? But if you go to if you go to somewhere in Africa, it's going to be around land or water or, or, or something like that, identity, and, or, or in fact identity. Um, and so and so those things will become monetized, not in the sense that somebody make a profit, they'll be used as a storage thing. So sure. You I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think this is a lot of what's going to create infrastructure that exists. If we don't have, if you take people, you can well, because you might, you might want to create that infrastructure in order to generate economic activity that sits above it. If you see so, I mean, yes, no, I'm not saying anyone would do this out of goodness. Well, what you say to selfless, right? That the yeah. reason the selfless would spread is because it shifted this as well. There was, there was, it was possible to capitalize building towers. And I think that unless it's possible to capitalize, Sorry, I was going to make a silly example, just because so, the land thing was making sense. But I mean, like, if you're a, if you're a Russian oligarch, right, you already put your money into London property. You know, but right now you have to go to all of the hassle of actually buying the house and hiring some servants to look at it. But I mean, if it, was, if it was all the blockchain, I know this goes to my boring internet things, aren't it, which you've heard a hundred times. There's a 
line of conceptual thought which says the blockchain makes the virtual world more like the physical world, because in the physical world you can only have one of things, whereas in the virtual world you can have an infinite number of things. And on the blockchain you can only have one of them. So the blockchain makes the virtual world more like the physical world. So, so if my London land is on the blockchain, which makes it easier and cheaper to transact, then it will become money-like in the sense it will be an asset that people would, would want to hold on the blockchain. And I'd much rather, if I'm a Russian oligarch, I'd much rather hold a coin that has the title over some land in London than a coin that has nothing, essentially. Mm. You see what I mean? So, well, this is all this. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting I, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, 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 think, I think unexpected consequences and plurality. Good. Uh, some people itching to ask questions back there? Yeah. I mean, picking up on that, um, on your discussion about unintended consequences, maybe this is particularly for David, and bringing slightly back 